What's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. So today we want to do a quick video. I want to talk a little bit about wastegates, blow off valves, what the purposes are, and some of the newer trends that some people are doing. I've been doing it the traditional way forever, so I don't know if I'll ever switch over to some of the newer stuff. So let's talk about blow off valves and wastegates, what the basic function is and why you need them. Comment, like, and subscribe. Appreciate it guys. All right, guys, if you're new to the channel or you just found this video on YouTube, uh, this is a very basic small block Chevrolet, uh, 23 degree heads, single turbo, two wastegates. These are 60 millimeter wastegates. I've got one on this side, one on this side. Now, neither one of these has priority flow. Uh, really good, but we'll talk about that in a second. These are Black Sheep Industries. They're upside down BSI. So that is Black Sheep Industries. We just got them facing up. And then the blow off valves, we have, these are JGSs. At some point, I'm gonna probably switch all of it over to BSI, Black Sheep Industries. I like their stuff. So the basic function of the wastegate, wastegates are on the hot side. So basically you got the headers coming out. It comes through. That's what feeds the turbocharger. Turbocharger is on a common shaft. So the faster this spins, the more air the compressor wheel moves right so the wastegate is generally how you control boost so in the top of this you have springs and some of these springs are really stiff and so it takes more exhaust pressure to open it and some of them are really soft and we use co2 pressure to open them and we got these vented to atmosphere a lot of people will vent them to the actual downpipe and that's fine either way works uh, this will be really loud if you have full exhaust so you would want to vent it into the downpipe but this is a race car it's really loud so we don't care about uh loudness so it's one of those things you have to be very careful also because if you have a lot of bins in this or if you have it really restrictive or the pipe is a little too small then you're going to have issues with these may not flow enough and so that brings to sizing but generally for me the bigger the wastegate is the better and so i have really really small light springs in these and they're about two pound springs and so basically at two pounds, we don't, if we didn't have CO2 pressure, that's all the boost it would make. The goal for me would be to have this thing so that it would make two pounds or less, zero pounds, ideally. Now, priority flow, what we talked about here, think about exhaust gases, right? They're coming in, they're coming around this bend. So this one, if it would have been moved here, it would have been more priority flow. So that means that when this valve opens, it's gonna dump more. A lot of people get something called boost creep. So boost creep, is when these are in a bad location or they're too small or it doesn't open enough. And what'll happen is say you're, you're, you're anticipating, you're only gonna get about 10 pounds of boost. You get 10 pounds of boost and then as RPMs climb, then it gradually creeps up to 11, 12, 13, 14. In some cases, it'll just run away and get 20, 25 pounds of boost. And that's how you end up having issues. So it's very important to get the wastegates properly sized. The bigger, the better. Make sure the springs are good and make sure they have good flow. Now, sometimes you can crutch it. Like in this case, the reason I've got these in this location and I didn't really worry about priority flow because these are monster gates. These are 60 millimeter gates. That means that valve in there is 60 millimeters and it is a big exhaust leak when it opens. So I can control boost fine there. Uh, so uh, ideally not the best setup the way it is, but it does work. Now let's talk about the lines a little bit. So to the side of the wastegate. So this is the one and all these lines are quarter inch on this. So this one right here runs over in T's and it goes into the compressor housing. And so basically it's a T right here. It comes out of the compressor, it goes into the T. Ideally this would run into this leg of the T and then off of that, but you know, that's minor. They're both gonna get the same amount of pressure, but sometimes that T like this will make one, it would make this one over here, get the boost a little bit faster than this one over here. But it doesn't seem to be bothering over here, but that's not necessarily the ideal thing to do. But anyway, so those run to the sides. So then you look and you go, okay, well, what is the line going to the top? You see, we've got this, this is the dome pressure sensor. And then we got more CO2 lines. These more, we got more push lock lines that go to the top. And so basically, if you follow these push lines up, you can notice there's one over here as well. This one runs to the inside of the car. And on the inside of the car, you see we've got a CO2 bottle. So that's a five pound CO2 bottle and our Holly controls it. Now there's lots of different ways for boost controllers to work. There's a lot of standalone ones, AEM, uh, boost lease. There's a whole bunch of different standalone 
boost controllers that you put a CO2 bottle in and then you turn the knob and it does the CO2 pressure. Now, a lot of times people get confused and they say, okay, well, I put CO2 pressure on it. So you build the map, the, the, the dome pressure map based on CO2 pressure, but it's not always one-to-one. -one. Ideally, it would be. So if you put five pounds of CO2 pressure on it and you've got a two pound spring in the wastegate, then what should happen is you should get five pounds of boost, but it's not always one-to-one. -one. You have to run the car, you have to play with it, you have to see how it, it works out. Sometimes it takes 30 pounds of CO2 pressure to make 15 pounds of boost. When that's the case, a lot of times you have some back pressure issues. That's also a time where you're running out of turbo. You might be getting close to the limit of the turbo, but basically what happens is if the turbo is the stopping point, so all the exhaust gases are kind of getting bunched up here, spinning this wheel, then what would happen is the wastegates would actually flow more because there's more of a restriction here, right? So if you think about it, it's like a water hose. So the exhaust is coming through, the water's coming through, and if this is real free flowing, you're not going to get a lot out of here. No matter how good a priority is, you're still going to get some, but not as much. But when you start restricting this area here, then the pressure increases. It's called back pressure. And then that makes it flow more, the wastegate flow more. But that's also when you get some boost creep issues like I talked about. There's a whole bunch of potential issues when you're dealing with wastegates. So this is the traditional wastegate setup on a gasoline engine. When you look at a big diesel engine, like big transfer trucks, when, uh, you know, a lot of, I guess a lot of the modern diesels have wastegates now. A lot of the wastegates are not external, they're internal. They're actually mounted into the turbo itself, into the turbine housing. But some of the older big rig diesels, they don't have wastegates at all. They size this turbo so that at X RPM, this thing is going full speed ahead, full tilt. And that's how they work. They, they, they actually size the turbo to fit the motor. But in the race car world, in the race car application, that's generally not the case. You have external wastegates, and this is how you control them. Now, one of the things that uh, people are doing now, there's a couple new wastegate styles out there. It's got a straight gate. It's got basically a flapper valve. They're basically capping these off. So they're capping off the external wastegates. And they're putting this wastegate on the charge pipe here. And basically, they're creating a big boost leak is what's happening. So they create a big boost leak, and they're able to control power based on that boost leak. Uh, now, there's a few things out there. Uh, Devin Vanderhoof, he's just now recently starting to try it. And he said he's going to share his data. So I'm really looking forward to his data that he's going to share about turbo compressor speed. Because generally, if you think about it, when you have a boost leak up there, the kind of the thought process in my head is if I have a big boost leak up here and this is spinning and the wastegates are not opening, then it's going to overboost. But I don't know if that's necessarily true or not. That's just the way I've always thought about it. But it may not be the case. What they're saying is actually happening. The motor makes less power, so the engine, the air pump moves less air. So then the turbo doesn't move as much air. So it ends up... It's a cycle to where everything is happy and it's actually is actually working. So I'm looking forward to that data. Um, he's going to share that with us at some point uh, when he gets some good data on it as far as how that's working. I know a lot of pro mod guys and a lot of the racing applications, they're doing that and it seems to be working. But sometimes like in a, in a lower power setup or a cheaper budget setup that might be harder on the turbo. It may not be. I don't know. We'll find out. So I'm very interested in that. So that's one of the new things. Assume in that same fashion, you can take these wastegates and actually mount them to the cold side as well and get the same result, um, I would imagine. So these are blow-off valves. Let's talk about these up here. So this is a blow-off valve. These are 60 millimeter blow-off valves. We got two of them. So the purpose of a blow-off valve, you've all heard import cars. You've all heard the Grand Nationals. They do a burnout or they make a street pull. Sounds awesome. Turbo's zinging up, singing. And then all of a sudden they let go to gas and you hear. And that noise, that that is compressor surge is what it is. Or compressor flutter, I guess is the formal name for it. But basically what's happening, when you close this throttle blade and you have air coming through here. And then suddenly boop, it stops and you can get no more air going into the motor. It's got to go somewhere. So it basically starts surging the turbo. And that's what's happening down there. And turbos, this is a forced induction turbo. It's a GTR 102. There is a slot down here. And this slot right here is the anti-surge slot. And I think the air is supposed to vent out of there. 
uh i think i know that that slot does suck air as well that's one of the tricks that a lot of turbo companies do is they they mess with those slots so they can suck a little bit of extra air so you would think that surge slot that ported housing ported shroud i think is actually what they call it it helps that so the air can come back through it probably also makes a difference in the compressor map when it's running so that if this is trying to charge and it's getting backed up and i've got a 7.3 diesel and it goes into compressor surge a lot if you look at the compressor map you have a map it's like an island and the island you want to be in the the, the map or slightly to the right. Slightly to the right is better than to the left. If you're over to the left, that's where you get into compressor surge. And so like on my diesel truck, my 7.3, if the engine RPM is low, but the load is high, so like at say 1800 RPM, 1600 RPM, and I'm going up a hill and I got my race car trailer behind me, with the factory turbo, you hear the turbo actually surging. So the motor is trying to consume air, but it's not consuming enough from what the turbo is making. And so it's just surging. It's a and that's exactly what it does the whole time. So you can change the blade angles. I actually changed the compressor wheel on my, my diesel. And now when it gets into that, I can hear the air rushing back into the air filter. And so, but it's not surging. So it's letting the air out without surging. I don't, I think it was called a wicked wheel or something. So the blow off valve is exactly what stops that from happening. When you slam the throttle closed, the blow off valve is open, releasing that pressure so you don't surge or flutter the turbo, protecting the turbo. This is operated. It's got a, a valve here. Now, this one is an older one, so it's got an actual spot right here to where we could put pressure and open this. If we wanted to put CO2 pressure, we could open it just like a wastegate here. But we've got it on the top, and this is vacuum. And so basically, when the engine is in vacuum, opens these. You can change springs in them. Some of them have adjusters on the end where you can adjust the tension. There's a lot of things you can do to make the blow-off valves more sensitive or less sensitive. But the big thing is, is the blow-off valve, the bypass valve is what they're called on a procharger or a supercharged car. They're wide open and you can really feel them moving a lot of air on a supercharger. But on a turbo application, generally they open as you give it gas and close it. So you, you give it gas, they close, and then you let off the gas and vacuum comes up and then the valve actually opens and that lets it breathe. And so, you know, of course, if this was a mass air car, that would be a problem because you would be losing air. So if you had a mass air car, you have to have a recirculating valve. You, you have to have a line going back into in front of the mass air meter or you have issues. So that is the way the blow off valves work. These things are very important. Uh, one valve generally is sufficient, but if you're moving on a lot of air or you pedal the car a lot, then that's where sometimes you want two valves. Procharger makes a valve now. It is a race valve. That's what Randy has on his. It's like 100 millimeters. It is massive. It's like a Coke can. Actually, it's bigger than a Coke can. It is massive. And so that one valve actually flows enough air so you don't have to have two. So less moving parts, less stuff to break. So if you notice, these vacuum lines, these are push lock lines. This is actually a 3 8 inch line. You see, I have this one going to vacuum source. And so the reason I went with a 3 8 inch line here is because think about a straw. So you have these chambers. These chambers have capacity, right? So in order for this valve to move, you have to suck the air out of this chamber. So if you have a very small uh, quarter inch or even smaller vacuum line or push lock line going to this, and in order to evacuate the air out of these chambers on the blow off valves, then it's going to take more time and you can see it i used to run quarter inch valves uh lines on this i used to run quarter inch lines on this and i could actually the valves were slow they were very delayed but when i upgraded and i went to this size the the three eighths push lock now they're faster they're happier they tend to work better and i've got that one run properly so the main vacuum line comes here and then it goes to the t and then ideally these lines would be about the same length the waste gates you could say okay well the same theory applies to the big lines but we use quarter inch line on all the co2 and all lines going to the waste gates that's something that's very important as just a reminder vacuum line when you have blow off valves it goes to a vacuum source when you have waste gates it does not go to a vacuum source it goes to a pressure source only and while we're talking about lines if you have a fuel pressure regulator which you do somewhere you want to have vacuum on that so that's the way you want to set those things up so you're good to go all right guys long video but the basics of waste gates and blow off valves and why it's important to have them and what they do and why they function so we'll see how the new stuff is working out y'all comment like and subscribe we'll see y'all soon later